All right. How's it going, guys? This is the FTO Nerd Talk, and we're doing more indie comic books today. Uh, today, we have Angel with uh, Amazing Action Comics. Angel, how's it going? Good, good, D. How you doing? I'm not too bad. Um, I'm not sure if you listened to my last podcast, but I'd like to, um, I'd like to throw in a couple of uh, questions about your comic book, questions about your company, and throw in some questions about uh, the current trend in nerddom right now. Like, uh, So I may throw you some... Uh, some comic book questions that about like news and whatnot. Maybe throw out some some stuff about some TV shows or video games. I hope you don't mind me doing oh, that. Sounds good to me. Right on. It just breaks up that, that monotony of just talking about one thing the entire time. For sure, and there's plenty of stuff to talk about outside of uh, oh. all in, in the North Kingdom. <laughs> oh yeah, tons, tons and tons. Uh, so tell me about uh, Amazing Action Comics. How long have you guys been around? So we're going probably, I want to say, on our second year, like officially. Like Justin and I, uh, we met about two years ago. Justin, and Justin Bartz, right? Justin Bartz, yes. Um, and we met like all relationships are online now these days. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and so uh, uh, we connected with one another. We were both going through frustrations with actually the whole indie scene of, you know, just trying to break into comics and, you know, as... as greatest technology is there's so much uh misinformation there's a whole bunch of things that are convoluted and there's a whole bunch of roadblocks that you know people still need to to hop over in order to get you know their stuff published give me um, this give me an example of that if you don't mind like is that? A, a example of one of those hurdles that you're talking about so if we're looking at the industry itself you have you know the big two which everyone knows marvel and dc and then right. it popped up in the 90s and they were like supposed to be like the biggest uh you know Forerunners for um, independent comics, right? Created by uh, by ex Marvel and DC writers and artists uh, like Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, and yep, yep, the like, uh, right? Valentino and uh, you know a lot of my favorite artists, Roger Cruz. I think also joined along us out there, and um, uh, Tony Daniel also is one of the few who joined along with those guys at, at Image. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think later on, though, I mean the the last one was uh, Robert Kirkman who actually. Right partner you know the whole walking dead thing. walking dead thing that kind of like brought image back when they were like they were sailing it after that whole uh big big 90s burst uh walking dead kind of brought them back into to some kind of reverence yeah 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 that, that was crazy like, i mean that 90s bubble just kind of changed the whole shift in the industry yeah. comics like, in general yeah 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 and and you know when the, they be, they became like the it thing for a while as far as like independent comics and it was so cool because i mean i was I was a big Tom McFarlane fan, still am. I mean, my first comic that I ever bought on my own, dollar ninety five, was Spawn. Yeah. One, um, and I, and you know that's when I actually got into comics is when Image actually started. I read stuff here and there before then, but when when they came on the scene, I I, I bought everything that I can get my hands on an Image, and for a while they were just like gung ho with like you know securing you know unknown artists and stuff like that. Obviously they weren't securing them where they were paying them because it's all, you know, whatever they make is they, they own the property, which was fantastic. Right. The company that, you know, was was for the creators um, themselves. And over the years, as, you know, companies get bigger and things expand, you know, things change as far as criteria and stuff like that. So now they're really, they're a lot more selective. So if we look at a lot of the stuff that's coming out. I would say more than 50% of the stuff that's coming out from Image is from already established artists. Gotcha. Or established people from the industry. So it makes it hard for people like yourself to get like get into that front door is what you're trying to tell me. Yeah, yeah. And for a company that doesn't really have a genre-based focus, I mean, they started off with a whole bunch of superheroes and they really, you know, yeah. spread it out to the, to the entire, you know. Wildcats, Divine Right, oh, uh, Dark Child. Yeah, they had like a lot of like superhero type-esque characters, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the teams, you got Youngblood, Cyber Force, and right. you know, all those guys. So... Yeah, so it's it's more established artists, and you know I get it. I mean, in the industry, you gotta you gotta put stuff out there that you know you think people are gonna buy and sell. Um, so it just makes it a little bit harder. The criteria or the bar has been set up a little bit higher okay. in regards to when you submit um, what properties they actually take on board um, for that. So that that becomes one hurdle where you know artists. I would I, I'm not gonna say that it was easier, but I think there was a greater chance for artists probably in the earlier 2000s to hook up with image than it is now. See, no, and, and you say all that, you say like about how people just wanted the superhero type characters, but I read your your two stories, uh, Shadow Breed and Red Hyena, and they both have like a superhero, anti-hero type feel for them. Shadow Breed is more of a, 
grifter cowboy type and Red Ahina is more like a mercenary for hire with a suit of armor that she uses when she needs it. Yes. And those are pretty like compelling characters. They they both have like their, their own type of identity to them also. What did you create these characters or was it Justin who created I did, Yeah, this is all Justin Bart's world. I mean, he created it, comes out of his head. We, we've had really great dialogue back and forth um, in regards to creating this universe and expanding it. You know, there's been subtle changes and it, it's been a really good, you know, back and forth with him because before I came on board with him, um, he was pretty much solo um, and he didn't have anybody really to bounce ideas off of. And right. you know, when I first read the story and I saw it, I was like, I was really intrigued. I had my own book that I was I had been working on at that time. And I said, why don't we just, you know, at that moment, we were kind of getting burned. He was working with another publisher that actually is not in business anymore. And I was shopping around for publishers uh, for quite a bit. And I said, you know what, instead of, you know, trying to get published by other publishers, let's just do it on our own. And he was fully on board. Um, and so I put my stuff on pause for a little bit. It's still in the background in the works to, to take all of this stuff because he was far along more than I was. So he already right. had five issues of Project Shot of Breed done. So the first actual story arc, the first trade is done. And then Red Hyena was a miniseries that was being introduced in Project Shot of Breed number four. And that miniseries is complete. So we have a total of eight books that are already done. So we're ahead of the game and we just started at the very beginning of this year actually in market to so about, I think, 10 or 15 stores that just picked us up. And these are stores that we just, you know, picked up the phone, we sent emails and to a bunch of people and, you know, they embraced that that independent scene. When, um, it, when it comes to those two characters, yes. uh, well, those two titles, uh, Project Shadow Breed and Red Hyena, they're both in black and white. Was that like intentional or that just like happenstance? No, so originally they were in color and original, uh, Justin's original idea was to have them in black and white because the, if we look at Project Shadow Breed, that book is meant to be more- It fits. It yeah. fits in black and white, yeah. yeah. And it's meant to be more horror. So if we're, I don't want to give too much away, but you have Marek who is a soldier who's stuck in between his transition of werewolf and man. And he's stuck in that permanent um, transition and you find out why later on in the series. And later on, you'll find out there are packs of these soldier wolves. So, so with Project Shadowbreed, that part of the universe, it's taking a spin on classical characters like the werewolf and Frankenstein, Mummy and Dracula, and, and, and approaching it from, more, uh, from a more scientific perspective. So all the myths that we know about those creatures, right. they don't exist in this universe, but those creatures exist. And you'll see how they come about. And what I know is what Red Hyena is like. It's, it's also black and white, and Shadow uh, probably Shadow Breed also plays a part because she takes the job to. Well, she actually goes out looking for the job herself about mm -hmm. this project Shadow Breed, looking into it. This is just the first issue that I read, but like her her comic is a little bit more brighter, a little bit um, uptone yep. than than uh, Shadow Breed's. Was that also intentional? That was also intentional. So if we look at that character and, and Julian Derber, who's in uh, the UK, right. the artist on that particular one. And it matches. I think, I think Stephanie uh, Magicianson was a uh, house. Yeah, it was a house. Right. Yeah, and uh, they're they're two completely different styles, and they work oh, yeah. over the books really well. And with uh, the red hyena, she's meant to be like sassy and sarcastic, and you know this person who's like she's highly intelligent. Um, she's a very skilled fighter. She's really, you know, she owns her ground. So she, her attitude is is part of uh, her character um, and the way that she deals with people. And, and it's really off-putting, especially to a lot of her, her enemies because of the way that she speaks to them with like this kind of carefree sassiness. Yeah. She, so she, knows, awesome. she knows how to play the fool, but she also, uh, she also has to be intimidating at the same time. Because, exactly, exactly. Because when she's being intimidating, that means like she's already won. And like, that's, that's always well done. So yeah, she walks into every single battle like she's already won with that type of attitude. And a lot I of times, for, yeah, for her opponents, it, it's intimidating. But at the same time, she's this, she's, go she's, she's a gorgeous black girl who's, who knows what she has and, and is not afraid to, to either, you know, show what she has or give what she has to get what she needs. Right on. Um, another question going to deviate from, like, from the comic book for a second. The HBO Max came out today. <laughs> Like, are you getting HBO Max? Do you care about any of that, any of that whatsoever? I pre-pre had HBO Max. Oh, so. geez. 
Yeah, we're, we're all good in that at arena. We're, just waiting, <laughs> we're waiting for 2021. That's what we're waiting for. Oh, you're waiting for the Snyder Cut then? We're waiting for the Snyder Cut. So what, what is it about the Snyder Cut that, that got you so interested? So, you know, there was so much back and forth with, you know, his, his what he was doing with the universe, um, starting with, you know, Superman and then, you know, uh, B versus uh, or as uh, yeah, B versus S right. and stuff like that, and and I didn't mind like the darkness that he had. I actually like the way he films movies, so it didn't bother me. I'm a big fan of his. Yeah, cinematography is nice. I'll always agree to that. Yeah, I mean, he did the same thing in 300 in that series right. and stuff like that. So yeah, it, and like it, it's, of course his zombie film Dawn of the Dead, same kind of tone to it. Exactly. So I was used to it, and I liked it, and it fit, and I liked the more adult, you know, serious tone to it. You know, was it a little bit dark for for most people? Yeah, but. I didn't mind it too much. Um, so I was already a fan from the beginning. And then, you know, when that whole thing happened with his daughter and he had a right. project, from what I'm understanding, and this is all, you know, still all out there in the ethernet, um, you know, he left the project, but the project was pretty much done. It was in post-production. And so when Josh Whedon came in, that's when they kind of rearranged things around. He kind of cherry picked some things and reshot some scenes himself that he thought would feel better. Yeah, with his, with and his what vision. I understand, yeah. a lot, a lot, because he, uh, from what oh, I understand... Over 45 minutes, I believe, yeah. Yeah, but now there's four hours of content, and the movie's supposed to have a completely different tone <laughs> um, of stuff, which is crazy. So they're talking about, you know, either releasing, you know, six short uh, miniseries, which I don't mind if they break it up that way, or, you know, two movies or whatever it was. Whatever they do, you know what? I have my HBO Max, 2021 comes around, guess what I'm doing? I'm sitting here. <laughs> I'm clicking on uh, I want to get back to the comic book, but I want to ask you one more question about this uh, this Snyder Cut here. So, Warner Bros. always said they're not going to make a sequel to uh, the J Justice League Snyder version, but you think, like, if it gets enough press, enough people watch, you think they'll change their mind about that? All right, so, you know, I'm listening to a lot of information I read just like everybody else, and I think most of the people were pretty spot on saying that, you know, if this was a different time, say this was back in, like, the early 2000s, before right. the social like streaming boom. If we didn't have this streaming boom where everybody can just stream everything, like, like, like from the dawn of Netflix, once Netflix came on scene, that changed everything. So how many streaming services do we have now? Got at least a good eight strong one out there right yes. now, yeah. I mean, if you can count more than 10 of your fingers. Uh, and they're gonna keep coming. And yeah. so it, it's gonna be the streaming wars. So I'm thinking, you know what? If, if the only way that this Snyder Cut happened is because the ability to, to be able to stream it online because it's still pouring, what, about $20, $30 million into it? Right. To actually finish it. So outside of that, with fan pressure, and you have, you know, the right, <laughs> the right environment to kind of You just, said that was some hesitation, fan well, pressure. <laughs> well, you know what? There, there was enough. And even even um, Snyder himself, Zack Snyder, kept posting stuff like every other week. You know, this is what I had done, this is what I had done. So I'm pretty sure he wants this movie to be done and finished because I think it was his baby. Yeah. I, I agree fact, with you. Yeah, I think the fact that this is happening is going to give him closure on that. But, dude, I'm telling you, if, if, if there's enough, if there's enough buzz and there's enough fandom around what this version is, I, I can almost guarantee that there'll be a push for something to happen into the theaters. Now, this is the coolest thing that I heard today about what they could do. So if we look at, you know, what they've done, instead of creating a universe of things, All right. there's already a multiverse. Right. So you have Nolan's version, right. which can be Earth whatever. You have Snyder's version, which can be Earth whatever. Then you have Matt Reeves' Batman is coming out. That can be Earth whatever. And they the don't Joker all have to also. stay in the same universe. They're just in all the same multiverse. Didn't like That's kind of like DC's big thing. That's been their thing since uh, Elseworlds started. Yes, it's multiverse. Yes, exactly. so, yeah. so even if this Zack Snyder you know, um, version is in Elseworlds, and it fits within the multiverse. This is right. you know, 54 Batman and stuff like that. I'm cool with that because then all they can do is keep creating movies. Catering to that one group of people who love that work so much. Yeah. Joker could be, Joker was a standalone movie, but that could be, you know, Earth 99 Joker. And then who knows down the road if they create an Elseworld movie where they can take all these different actors that play these different roles and put them into a movie that's an Elseworld multiverse movie. So they so set that. He's like you're pumping yourself up for this. Like you like you hype yourself up pretty high for this. <laughs> it's funny because they set the groundwork for it, probably not even realizing it, but they're already ahead of the game to do something in a multiverse that Marvel hasn't done because they were late on the game for playing that 10-year 
run that Marvel did. But what what they what they slack, they also made up for by like making everyone happy in their own separate type type universes. No, I get you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Shazam was great. You know, uh, Wonder Woman standalones are great. The right, Man's are great. So. And you know they they didn't interact, but they did acknowledge the other existence of. And that was the cool part. Like I didn't need to see them like commingling with each other, but like the fact that like they all know about each other made it pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. So there's so many there's so many great things that can come out of this, and you know with HBO Max coming and I, I, streaming for us uh, for the next generation is everything. I mean, these guys have. We grew up in a generation where you had to sometimes get up to turn the channel on the TV. Um, or you only had, you know, less than 25 channels to, to choose from. And now these kids these days, they have everything. I mean, they don't, they don't even have to watch live TV. They can no. do anytime they want. It's, it's literally on demand. On demand. It's yeah. beautiful. The potential is endless for what, what they can do. And uh, since, we, since we got so deep inside, I want to move back to your comic books just for oh. one second. You mentioned that uh, the character inside Operation Shadow Breed is – part werewolf, I'm guessing Lycan, part human. Mm -hmm. And I read like in the first issue that he transformed a person into one thing. When he was another one, like, like, like this lucid type trip thing going on, transformation. Uh, is is he pretty much like a hunter is what I'm gathering for this? Like, can you tell me about that? Or like that kind of hush hush right No, now? no, yeah. So I mean, it, most of the stuff comes out in that first arc. So it, it's, it's all cool. Um, so think of a soldier wanting to do the best thing that he can, which is serve his country and then just hops into this program that allowed him to be sort of like a super soldier. Okay. You got this experimental serum that's being used and you have this uh, a relationship between uh, the military and the US government, we'll, 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 the CIA agency. And they've got this serum, that's, this serum that's developed that allows them to turn ordinary humans into these werewolf creatures. But they still have their human abilities and stuff like that. They can still speak. They just have like enhanced speed, but they actually turn into literally werewolves. Huh. Now the serum is really important because the serum you find out where it comes from later that allows them to be able to do this stuff. And you find out like he's he's not a first generation of the of these uh, werewolf soldiers. He's kind of like the the second or third. So by then the formula has already been you know it, it's done. It, it's been formatted. It's 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 safer for those. So you find out what happens to those guys that actually were first generation. Will how about how about this? So since we're gonna figure out what this formula does and like where it came from, how long it's been around, is uh, knowing that information gonna open up the world of like this universe for more titles to come out? Hell yes. So okay. right now you have just Project Shadowbree, which is like a flagship that starts everything. It's, it's okay. The of the universe, and then you have Red Hyena, which is gonna be another section of the universe, and then. We already have up to, I believe, Justin, we were going over today, he's got up to issue 20 already written out. We've My got goodness. It plan yeah, planned out. Um, Julian Derber, who did uh, Red Hyena, he's actually doing issues 10 through 15. I, myself, am doing issues 6 through 10, so I'm doing the next volume. And then Julian's hopping onto the volume after that. And what we're doing right now is actually just finalizing um, what, char what particular characters uh, look like and traits. So we've got those character setups and then we're right to the drawing board um, to finish off, you know, all the way up to issue 20. And and by the time you get to issue 20, which is going to be the fourth arc, I believe, then it's going to open up the universe even more to these other characters that are being introduced. So you got you got four volumes sitting and waiting to be put out there for everyone to read. And like you still got maybe another two or three more volumes after that waiting to be put out also. Like, so you guys are full cylinder story-wise on this you just gotta get the art to catch up with you then print those bad boys out correct correct wow. so we're we're ahead of the game i mean we've got two books now we've got uh i have a book sitting on a burner right now that's that's my story that um i'm hoping to get out either by the fall or early 2021 and thank you can tell us about it yeah it, I, it's it's actually called guardian city and it's um it's really it's about a, a demon um who is seeking asylum in our dimension um, and this whole first story arc is about her going through the process of how she got to our dimension and who she's seeking asylum from. All the while, um, she's being protected by this organization called the World Order of Saints, huh. who kind of just protects Guardian City and, and it talks about where Guardian City comes from. Um, it it's actually sits off the coast, of the east coast of the U.S. It's a separate island. So she's, she's, she's a reality jumper. She's a reality jumper, yeah, but you find out why she's come to this dimension and stuff throughout the book. Is, um, it, is it the same universe as Shadow Breed and Red Hyena, or is it like a separate story? 
So originally it wasn't, but then when Justin and I met, we had so many ideas going. <laughs> oh, they're, they're really Let's just throw it all in the pot, man. <laughs> throw everything we can into the pot. So yeah, so eventually the, the universes will will um, touch one another. That's uh, cool. Do you guys, you guys have a name for the universe? Not yet. Not yet. That That's still all early stage stuff. I and mean, that's probably going to be like, you know, mid 2021, late 2021. It's like you guys just wanted to come to you and you don't want to force it. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of stuff has just come organically with us just having because we have a weekly meeting every week and just that go. story sounds amazing, by the way. Like the story Dude. you just told me sounds really good. Yeah, and that's only one angle of it because you know, <laughs> it, yeah, like my head is about to explode because we have so many ideas and we just got to get it out. And all the while, so what's really unique about us is because we're we're still doing you know all the groundwork when it comes to the layout, the stories, the books themselves. But then we're also taking the business side of it as well. So, you know, being able to reach out to stores, we have to, you know, make sure that uh, the books are going out and being shipped for whoever's ordering them. Um, I mean, all this stuff like that, you know, like a distributor like Diamond takes care right. of, we're doing ourselves. And we're doing it at a pace where we can handle because um, we had reached out to so many people. And, you know, as much as I would love to, you know, be in 200 or 500 stores nationwide, logistically, we wouldn't be, be able to handle it. And doing a smaller, it also makes a... Uh makes it a little bit more personal with your with your readers like you know like the people who are buying it actually are reading it and like they're absorbing it instead of just putting on all these issues and they sit like in, in back boxes and they just sit like in the back of a comic book shop things like that so yeah which like, sucks because you know i got my comic shop and i'm there twice a week helping out and stuff like that so i know what the back end of right that looks like so i mean this industry just has so many pieces and puzzles to it and it's cool to be on the publisher side on the artistic side and on the retailer side and see how everything is kind of cohesive and how it works um, all together. So but, you, you got some experience like with how comic books are distributed towards people and how shops distribute like their comic books towards their customers as well. So you get like a good, good forward view of both of those, those angles. Yes. Yes. And, and you know, it's funny because every comic shop, even if they're within, you know, a five mile radius, they have their particular customers and they have their particular, you know, what they carry, on right. the shelves. Every, every comic shop you walk into has a distinct feel and you can get that feel as soon as you look on the shelf you can tell oh what kind of yeah by, by the shelves by how many tables they have set up for card games or whatnot uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. you can always tell what the feel is if uh, -huh. uh if the shop is smaller with comics but bigger with tables it's not much of a comic book shop no offense but yeah yeah but you know what it, it's it's those those guys they're they're pivoting Right. Because this industry, it's not the 90s anymore. It's and not. we have so much competition with this technology, getting their stuff from technology. And it's tough. And most kids don't want to read a comic book because they're not introduced to it at a very young age. They, they get the older guys who talk tablets. about storage. Yeah. So it, so for the next generation that's coming up, it's, you know, how do we entice them with an actual you know, a floppy was what I call them, a single issue. <laughs> and, and, and you, you are old head, my friend. <laughs> uh, dude, you have no idea. But but understanding that, you know, how how do we how do we how do we engage them so that we can actually incorporate technology and this the the, the old school brick and mortar that we love? Because right. I'm in favor. Every brick and mortar store can 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 shut down except for a comic shop. So I don't care about like retail for clothing and stuff like that. And <laughs> Amazon, and, but to walk into an actual comic book shop, hold the book in your hand. There's no feeling no. like it. I agree with dude, you. Dude, yeah, just to hold it. There's no feeling like it. Uh, like you, even, even if you're not like a comic book fan like that, even if you don't care about like uh, this type of nerdum, being inside a comic book shop just fills you with a certain type of excitement that you can't really put your name on because there's so much passion in a room when it comes to a comic book store that it's uh, it, you can't really compare it to anything else. I know that may sound hokey to some people, but that's just <laughs> how it is. Yeah. Not at all. I definitely, yeah, especially and if, if it's a Wednesday and it's packed. <laughs> it's packed? Oh, yeah. You get it. And then you people, got conversations. People will drag all their friends inside that place on a Wednesday. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, to deviate a little bit from the comic book, again, I want to come back and talk about Red, Red Hyena after this, but yeah. uh, I just saw this fan post of uh, Black Panther with Namor in Black Panther 2. Like, I, I don't know if Namor's going to be in a sequel or not, but like, let's humor the fact that like, it could possibly be that. And the poster had Luke Evans as Namor, not mm -hmm. a not a person I was casting Namor. That's that's just me talking. Yeah. Who who would you possibly cast as Namor if he was in a sec the sequel to Black Panther? Dude, they already messed that up. You know that, right? In what way? Because Universal owns the Namor nope. character, or nope. Jason Momoa. Oh yeah, 
Dude, he would have been the best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anybody that looks like him in that respect, <laughs> dude, he looks like Nemo. He looks like he, a yeah. Nemo. He has and like those so eyes are like very cool. intense. Yeah, you just got to put some wings on his feet and he's good to go. And just have him keep on saying Imperious Rex over and over again and you're good to go. That's it. So <laughs> I, honestly, I can't think of anyone else that would probably be a good name more. You know, um, I was thinking the same thing also. Like, you know what? They already put him as Aquaman. So I can't really say, yeah. you know, Jason Momoa is this. But, uh, well, I mean, look at Chris. Chris Evans was uh, in Fantastic Four and he was Captain America. Jeez, you're right about both of those things. Yeah. So, it, it, you never know. I mean, well, it's, it's a, like it could happen, but then with this whole thing with Amber Heard that's going around, so like it could have possibly changed around. You never know in the future, but uh, yeah, yeah, like I feel like they, they screwed Marvel screwed the food for not signing Momoa yeah. to that role instead of having him at an Iron Man. Play two water dudes, that's all. Just give him some like <laughs> healthish ears and stuff. If there, if there were anyone I would cast, it'd probably be uh, Riz Ahmed. Who's that? He, he was uh, he was in Rogue One. He was in uh, Nightcrawler. He was in the Venom movie. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. Like bulk him up a little bit. I think uh, Riz Riz Ahmed. He can probably be he can probably be the guy to put on mm. the Namor suit. He can be a villain. Be a pretty hardcore villain. Like we saw him in Venom. He was a good villain in that movie. So yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, I you know I I think they can stay away from the name. They put a no name in there. They can do the part really well. Because you already have, you know, the, the cast of, of uh, Black Panther is already, you know. Stable as is. Yeah, they, they won't change that at all. An unknown that can just, like, stand up against, you know, that cast, and then you're good to go. Because That's he, what I think they did wrong with uh, to Bloodshot. As much as I love Vin Diesel in my Fast and Furious movies, they, they should have been an unknown for that lead. He wasn't the guy for the role for you? Uh, you know what? I just I just kept hearing in my head, ride or die, ride or die. <laughs> Yeah. Are, you, are you saying he's typecast that he can't be anything else but Toretto? He can't be anything else except for <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and it's funny because I don't know if you ever, if you get a chance, his commercials, I think they were in the 90s. He did these like sharp toy commercials. Oh, yeah, I saw him. Oh, dude, I, I had it on replay for so long because I could not believe that was him. Okay, how could he reach that tone? Like he was super happy and excited the entire time. Like this is not the this is not the Vin Diesel I've been seeing for the past ten years. No, no, but yeah, he, yeah, he had some roots there, man, because he was playing with some shark toys and he was, <laughs> out. he was going pretty nuts. He's like a uh, uh, was a Joe Montana when it comes to D and D. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, look how far he's come. So I I don't knock him. I mean, he did a job that he needed to do, but. I, I just couldn't see him in that role. I think if it was an unknown, I would have probably gotten more out of the movie. And even during the pandemic, like the movie still like made his money back. So I guess there's that too. So did it really? Well, I know I, it went on. Uh, didn't it go streamed? Yes, yes, yeah. it did. Yeah, because I know like Trolls made his made his money and a profit during the whole three thing. Also, so yeah, yeah, that's that's what's scary. I mean, I'm I'm cool with stuff getting streamed and stuff like that, but I, I really hope you know movie theaters come back because I'm a fingers movie. crossed. Yeah, because I, I love the experience of, you know, paying my money, getting my seat, my popcorn, and being in that big screen. Uh, <laughs> if, if they do, you know, 1% capacity and I'm the only person in the theater, well, I'll do it. You'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. Don't hold the theater down. Uh, to go back to, to Red Hyena, yes. um, I'm reading her story. Uh, she's uh, She is something else. Like you said before, she knows how to be professional when she wants to be professional. Mm-hmm. She knows how to be... Uh, act aloof when she wants to act aloof but uh there was a scene when she was at a strip club and she just passed out at the at the bar while she was like having fun partying all the all the stripper female yep. strippers yep. and like it tells you a little bit about her character like either she's lonely or she just doesn't give a care about what she does and she was so disappointed that she spent so little of money you know like she's uh was it her one time treason card is what she said yeah and uh it's just it tells you a lot about that character. Are we going to see anything from her family in the future comics? I took a question. That, that I don't know. That would be a Justin Barr's question. I mean, gotcha. We spoke about her in detail. And, you know, the way that I look at her is if you look at someone who is at the highest of their game and really has no competition, you know, if, if they're doing what they're doing, if she's the best of the best and there's no competition, how would that person, you know, act, you know, uh, job after job? Does it get monotonous? You know, she's looking for the next big challenge. And when she can't find it, 
everything is just aloof to her. So in that instance that you saw her, she needed to escape and that was with alcohol. I was just to get butt ass drunk right. and just to, to black out. So, but what's interesting is after that first issue, her competition does start to come in. So you, you, you meet this guy, I think at the end of issue one, if I'm not mistaken, his name is Rockjaw. Um, and then the, he's your first taste in, in the Red Hyena I think, that, world. I think that's who she was going after in the last issue. Like she was going after to take on this Rockjaw character. Yeah, so he's your introduction to like the superhuman aspect or, or enhanced human aspect um, in her world. Because in Project Shadow Breed, I believe the Persuader absolutely was in issue one. Right. And the Persuader is that enhanced human, the first enhanced human that Marit comes across that's similar to him. Um, and you find out probably within the second or third issue when he starts talking to him how close they are in regards to their strength, agility, all that stuff. Well, these, these both of these stories are written very well. Like, uh, you really get a taste for the characters. It really makes you want to see what happens to these guys next. Uh, before we close out on this, like, where can we find these comics? Yeah, so you can go to amazingactioncomics.com and you'll find we have all the comics online. Um, in, the, in the beginning, we actually didn't have any of the variants. We did a bunch of homage over, uh, variants right before the pandemic uh, came on, and we were making them exclusive to just stores because that's how we were supporting them. Um, but then when everything closed down, we put all the variants up on as well on the site. So they are available. And what we're doing, which is what a bunch of like indie publishers have been doing, is that any purchases that they make online, if they nominate a store, we're giving 50% of that purchase to that store. Oh, wow. So the price is, yeah, actually passes over and stuff like that. So once pretty much more than half of the U.S. is up and running, uh, we're just going to keep doing that and supporting as many stores as we can. But they can get all the information off of the site. And what, what social media outlets can people find you on? Um, so we're on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, Twitter. It, it's funny because each one of them is a different um, hashtag. <laughs> uh, or our username because it's it, they all have different lengths that they use. So if you go to just amazingactioncomics.com, you'll see all of our information where you can contact us. Right on. All right. Well, this is the FTL Nerd Talk. Angel, thank you so much for joining me. This has been fun, man. Talking about a lot of nerd stuff and like this cool comic book and like your creation on top of it. What's the name of your future title? It's going to be called Guardian City. Guardian City. That's right. I got to look out for that. Yeah. I'm, thank I'm, you. I'm, thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. You enjoy the rest of your day, man. Thank you. Thanks to you. Take it easy.